golden mountains appeared after the dried up Euphrates River. Imagine a world where myths from long ago come true, where the secrets of history are uncovered in the most unexpected places. Welcome to the mysterious site where the Euphrates River once flowed. But now, something extraordinary has emerged from the parched riverbed. A sight so stunning it has left experts baffled and visitors in awe. Join us on an unforgettable journey as we explore the golden mountains that appeared after the dried up Euphrates River. You won't believe your eyes? We are Jesus Eternal Aura. In today's video, you will have appropriate answers to all the questions above. Before you know what happened, subscribe to the channel, like this video, and click the bell icon for all the latest updates. The Tigris River, alongside the Euphrates, is one of the two major rivers that define Mesopotamia. Of these two, the Euphrates is the westernmost. In the Bible, God promised the land between these rivers to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their descendants as part of the promised land. This river holds significant historical and religious importance being central to the ancient civilizations that flourished along its banks. Etymologically, the name Euphrates has various proposed origins. It might have derived from the old Persian word Ufratu, or the Avestan word Hu Perethua, meaning good to cross. Some scholars also suggest a Kurdish origin, where Farah means wide, Ri means flowing water, and Hat means flowing thus translating to wide flowing water. The modern Kurdish name Ferat could be a shortened version of this. However, the Indo-European origin is debated as the Sumerian and Akkadian names for the Euphrates are Buranun and pu rat tu respectively. The name Buranun appears in inscriptions about King Gudea suggesting that the old Persian name likely predated the Iranian influence. The Euphrates River was crucial to the development of early civilizations in Sumer around 3000 BC. Prominent ancient cities such as Mari, Sippar, Nippur, Shurupak, Uruk, Ur, and Eridu were located on or near its banks. The river stretches approximately 1,730 miles, 2,780 kilometers. It forms when the Kara, western Euphrates, and the Murat, eastern Euphrates, rivers merge. The Kara originates from the Armenian highlands in modern-day eastern Turkey, north of Erzurum, while the Murat comes from an area southwest of Mount Ararat and north of Lake Van. The upper Euphrates flows through steep canyons and gorges before moving southeast across Syria and into Iraq. In eastern Syria, it is joined by the Kabur and Balik rivers, both originating in Turkey. Downstream, no additional rivers feed into the Euphrates. North of Basra in southern Iraq, the Euphrates merges with the Tigris to form the Arvand Shat al-Arab, which then flows into the Persian Gulf. Historically, the river split into multiple channels at Basra, creating extensive marshlands. However, during the 1990s, Saddam Hussein's government drained these marshes to quell the rebellious Marsh Arabs. Since the 2003 invasion of Iraq, there have been efforts to restore the marshes, but their future remains uncertain. Navigation on the Euphrates is limited. Only boats with a very shallow draft can travel as far upstream as the Iraqi city of Hit, which is 1,330 kilometers, 200 miles, from the river's source and only 53 meters, 58 yards, above sea level. Beyond hit, the river becomes unnavigable due to rocks and rapids. The river experiences annual flooding when the snow melts in the northeastern Turkish mountains. New dams and reservoirs have mitigated some of these floods. There is also an 885 kilometer long, 550 mile long canal between the Euphrates and the Tigris that allows river barges to navigate. 
In Genesis 2.14, the Euphrates is one of the four rivers flowing out of the Garden of Eden. It is mentioned as the fourth river, following the Pishon, the Gihon, and the Tigris. The Euphrates also marks the border of the land promised by God to Abraham and his descendants, often referred to simply as the river, Hanahar, in the Hebrew Bible. The name Euphrates is linked to the root word meaning to flow out, emphasizing its significance as a life-giving river. The book of Revelation foretells that in the near future, the Euphrates River will dry up before the Battle of Armageddon. This prophecy aligns with Islamic beliefs found in the hadiths of Prophet Muhammad. According to these sayings, the Euphrates will reveal a mountain of gold as it dries up, leading to strife and conflict. In Sahih Bukhari, it is stated that when the river uncovers its treasures, people should not take anything from it. Another hadith mentions that the hour will not come until the river Euphrates dries up and shows the mountain of gold for which people will fight. This conflict is predicted to be so severe that 99 out of 100 people will perish, with each survivor hoping to be the sole survivor. Today, the Euphrates River is indeed receding. Hydroelectric projects in upstream Turkey and Iran have significantly reduced the river's flow, disrupting the lives of thousands of Iraqis who depend on it. Seasonal droughts and poor water management exacerbate the situation, leaving the region vulnerable to the effects of climate change. Research suggests that precipitation in Iraq could decline by 15 to 20 percent this century, potentially reducing the water volume in the Tigris and Euphrates rivers by up to 73 percent. The declining water levels allow salty tides from the Persian Gulf to infiltrate river deltas, contaminating fields of barley and wheat and killing livestock. Farmers face the dire choice of abandoning their land and moving to cities or waiting for government intervention, which has so far been inadequate. The Euphrates River, with its rich historical, cultural, and religious significance, is now a symbol of the challenges facing the region. Its decline underscores the urgent need for sustainable water management practices and international cooperation to preserve this vital waterway for future generations. The challenges on the periphery are consistently ignored due to the acrimonious political conflicts in Baghdad. While the Hadith may have been wrong about a mountain of riches buried beneath the Euphrates, the struggle it foretold is taking on new significance as drought floods the cities with refugees. Accurate data regarding displacement is difficult to obtain because many newcomers to cities choose to remain anonymous. Yet, reports indicate that new social tensions are rising between city locals and rural transplants. Plastic shantytowns have appeared on the outskirts of Basra in southern Iraq as refugees looking for work cluster around the city's perimeter. It may take time for newcomers to acclimate to their new reality, often finding transient jobs that are insufficient to meet their needs. Locals in Basra feel that newcomers are a burden on public resources and bring criminal activity and incompatible customs. Municipal officials point to the increased influx of migrants to explain their political failings, refusing to integrate them and thereby increasing tensions. The newcomers in southern Iraqi cities are often blamed for power outages or fuel shortages. There are no indications that the refugee situation will abate soon. An estimated 85 miles of the riverbank are now barren due to rising salinity levels from the Persian Gulf. Climate experts warn that the current crisis is just a signal of what's to come. Aid organizations estimate that within the next few months, 12 million people in Iraq and Syria will lack access to food, water, or energy. A more severe refugee crisis is brewing in Egypt, with a population 2.5 times larger than Iraq's. Ethiopia and Sudan are completing a large hydroelectric project 
on a major Nile tributary. An Egyptian scientific survey suggests that this project could destroy 75% of Egypt's fish farms, potentially displacing 30 million people, making it the largest refugee crisis in history. Even if the project is cancelled, Egypt will still face challenges similar to other regional countries, a growing population and a drying environment. Mitigating the devastation requires more than collaboration among Middle Eastern neighbors. It needs global efforts to reduce reliance on fossil fuels. While wars and elections dominate the news cycle, the global economy's dependence on fossil fuels is closing the window of opportunity to turn things around. Climate-induced instability is already evident in Iraq's troubled social fabric. Those in dire situations will do whatever it takes to provide for their families. ISIS has preyed on victims of poor harvests and starvation, offering quick cash and protection when governments couldn't. It's not a stretch to imagine other terrorist groups doing the same. Drought inevitably leads to displacement, tension, criminal activity, and recruitment. The riverbanks that saw the beginning of civilization 8,000 years ago may now be indicating the beginning stages of a collapse. Finally, there are significant disputes over the rights to use the Euphrates. The southeastern Anatolia project in Turkey involves constructing 22 dams and 19 power plants the largest development project in Turkey's history. The construction of the first dam was completed in 1990. Despite this development, Southeast Turkey continues to face economic hardships, exacerbating the discontent of the Kurdish minority in the region. In Syria, the completion of the Tabaka Dam in 1973, also known as the Euphrates Dam, resulted in the creation of Lake Assad, which is utilized for irrigating cotton fields. Additionally, Syria has dammed two of the Euphrates tributaries and is currently in the process of constructing a third dam. Iraq, on the other hand, has built seven dams, but under Saddam Hussein's regime, water management was not prioritized. However, following the fall of the Ba'ath regime in 2003, the importance of water usage has been significantly elevated. People often know Elon Musk as a billionaire with a huge fortune, a crazy genius with unique ideas. The reason for his popularity is because he has good statements on many social media platforms and gives many interviews. On social networks, he regularly tweets his thoughts and predictions for the future. Often the content of his shares is often related to technology and his views on things going on in the world. But recently, he has made a lot of statements related to God and the end of the world. In particular, he paid a lot of attention to the fact that the Euphrates River was gradually drying up. He saw signs that not everyone could recognize with his intelligence and sharp awareness around things happening in the world. Many people will be shocked to hear what Elon Musk said about this biblically important river. So, what did he say? And why after knowing what he said made everyone so worried about the future? What is the truth behind it? Watch till the end to find all the answer for these questions. If you like our video, don't forget to like and subscribe because it helps us a lot. Elon Musk has changed his faith. As you know, Elon Musk has repeatedly asserted that he is an atheist and only believes in science and technology. He does not worship anything but is only interested in developing the humanity. Hear what he had to say in an interview with Soul Pancake. What do you worship? Well, I don't really worship anything, but I, I do devote myself to the advancement of humanity uh, using technology. But don't be fooled into saying that Elon Musk knows nothing about the Bible. From an early age, Musk was baptized and received Holy Communion. When he went to school, he attended Anglican Sunday School and studied at Jewish preschool. And he truly grew up with the Bible, even considering the Bible as a beacon that illuminates his path every time he loses direction in life. He shared this in an interview with Babylon Bee. I mean, at one point, I, I, you know, when I was a kid, I was like, I had this existential crisis and I was trying to figure out what's the meaning of life. And I was like, oh, it all means nothing. It's all, and, and, I, and I, you know, read like 
a whole bunch of religious books, including the Bible. And I'm like, there's a bunch of things in there that I didn't teach you in Sunday school. Uh, he continued to show great love and respect for the Bible, that he also always remembers the lessons of God and always respects them. And it really helped him become the richest person in the world today. Elon's criticism on various biblical accounts. Have a look. I mean, let's just say, like, I agree with the principles that Jesus advocated. You know, there's some, some, there's great wisdom in what, in, in the te teachings of, of Jesus, uh, and I agree with those teachings. And things like turn the other cheek are, are very important because, as opposed to an eye for an eye, um, an eye for an eye leads everyone blind. So, forgiveness, you know, is important and um, treating people as you would wish to be treated. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Very important. Many Christians may not be aware that the name Elon originates from Hebrew, meaning Oak Grove. It appears six times in the Old Testament, designating a place in Palestine and being attributed to a Hittite and two Israelites. Additionally, it identified as a judge of Israel in chapter 12 of the Book of Judges. What should we do when the Euphrates River dries up? As we reflect on the drying up of the Euphrates River, a biblical sign often interpreted as heralding the end of the world, we're compelled to consider our readiness for the cataclysmic events foretold in Scripture. The book of Revelation vividly portrays a scene of divine wrath, with the earth convulsing, mountains and islands shifting, stars plummeting from the heavens, and the sky recoiling like a scroll. In this moment of reckoning, both kings and slaves tremble before the judgment of God as He rains down upon a corrupt earth. Amidst the looming specter of these apocalyptic events, what preparations can Christians make? While physical readiness may seem prudent, the Apostle Peter offers a clarion call to a different form of preparation. Rather than fortifying ourselves in fear or stockpiling provisions, Peter urges us to embrace holy conduct and godliness. As we anticipate the day of God, hastening its arrival through our righteous actions, we are reminded that the dissolution of the heavens and earth will ultimately give way to a new creation. Peter's exhortation echoes the teachings of Jesus and Paul, emphasizing the importance of practicing love and kindness towards others. Instead of succumbing to a fortress mentality, we are called to engage with the world around us, extending grace and compassion to all, especially to those within the household of faith. Jesus' golden rule, treat others as you would want to be treated, encapsulates this ethos of selflessness and empathy. In our present era, characterized by rampant individualism and moral relativism, it's easy to lose sight of our interconnectedness and shared humanity. Yet, as Peter reminds us, our ultimate destiny, whether king or beggar, is to stand before our Creator on Judgment Day, each soul valued equally in the eyes of God. Interestingly, Elon Musk's quest for simplicity amid complexity resonates with deeper philosophical truths about existence and dependence. Our contingent nature underscores our reliance on something greater for our very being, prompting us to heed God's teachings and embrace humility before our Creator. In these uncertain times, marked by signs that could be construed as portents of the end, let us not be consumed by fear or speculation. Instead, let us heed the timeless wisdom of Scripture, cultivating lives of holiness, love, and service to others. As we navigate the challenges of our age, may we find solace and strength in God's Word, trusting in His guidance and provision as we journey toward the fulfillment of His kingdom. Following the splash landing of the Dragon capsule in the Gulf of Mexico in 2020, the chief engineer and CEO of SpaceX acknowledged that he resorted to prayer. Elon Musk himself stated later that, I'm not very religious, but I prayed for this one. He continued speaking, I think this is something that the whole world can take some pleasure in and can really look at this as an achievement of humanity. He continued, these are difficult times when you know there's not that much good news, and I think this is one of those things that is universally good no matter where you are on planet Earth. This is a good thing, and I hope it brightens your day. Not only that, he wrote on X that Jesus taught love, kindness, and forgiveness. I used to think that turning the other cheek was weak and foolish, but I was the fool for not appreciating its profound wisdom. Comments such as these at least imply that Musk has not completely dismissed the gospel. Despite previously feeling embarrassed when questioned about God and adamantly declaring he did not worship anyone, Musk appears to be gradually evolving and undergoing significant shifts in his spiritual journey. Therefore, it's not entirely unexpected that when faced with the issue of the Euphrates running dry, many attributed it to natural causes like drought. 
However, Musk delved deeper into the matter. His comments are as biblical as Musk's claim that we are living in a world that was created by something and could not have appeared out of nowhere. It's like asserting that a person with infinite strength and power created the world and himself, and that person is our almighty Lord Jesus. When questioned about his belief in God, Musk responded by suggesting that something brought about the universe's existence, or simply that the universe exists. When further probed about the origins of the universe, the billionaire entrepreneur remarked that one could interpret whatever initiated the universe as God, depending on individual perspective. A few years back, Musk tweeted, If I die under mysterious circumstances, it's been nice knowing ya. When asked about his belief in an almighty creator, Musk responded that he was fine with the idea of going to hell, considering the vast number of humans who would be there. While Musk hasn't explicitly identified as a Christian, he has never denied the existence of God. He also demonstrates an understanding of the end times, implying that no one will escape, including himself. He suggests being prepared to accept God's decisions, whether leading to heaven or hell. Perhaps Musk's acceptance of the idea of hell stems from the notion, as expressed by the devil to Eve, that you surely will not die, granting him the freedom he desires. Though it may seem unlikely from our perspective, if Musk were to become a believer with God, all things are possible. With knowledge of the Bible as well as love for God, Elon Musk has recently highlighted potential threats and dangers to humanity and the environment. In his latest announcement, he suggested that the Euphrates River might dry up. This is particularly significant because according to the Bible, the drying up of the Euphrates River is associated with the end of the world. Musk's statement has stirred some concern as it could pose a global threat. Musk likely has valid reasons for making such claims, and we will explore how his findings correlate with the historical records documented in the Bible. Let's hope it doesn't come as too much of a shock for you. Ever since Jesus Christ mentioned that only God knows the timing of the second coming and the birth of a new generation, various preachers and individuals self-identified as doomsayers have attempted to predict these events. Phrases like God's final judgment is imminent, possibly within our lifetime so prepare yourselves have become common. Recently, prophets have provided new interpretations prompting discussions and debates in online forums, Bible study groups, and churches. Despite the fervent discourse, why do many appear fearful? To grasp this, we must delve into a chilling narrative concerning the Euphrates River. The most unsettling aspect for many is the perceived unfolding of the Bible's prophecy of the world's end right before their eyes. Numerous individuals believe that crucial sections of the Book of Revelation point to the significance of Iraq in the apocalyptic scenario. Chapter 16 of Revelation specifically references the Euphrates River stating, The sixth angel poured his bowl on the great river, the Euphrates. Its water was dried up to clear the way for the kings from the east. This verse describes the sixth angel pouring a bowl into the Euphrates River, causing it to dry up. Past instances of bold judgments have resulted in the loss or contamination of much of the world's water. However, this action isn't intended to worsen the water quality or restrict human usage. Instead, it appears to symbolize the removal of a barrier, enabling the kings from the east to advance. Referred to five times as the Great River in the Bible, the Euphrates historically delineated the eastern border of Israel's territory. Its formidable presence, coupled with the desert expanse separating Israel from Canaan, provided a natural defense. Stretching over 2,000 miles towards Palestine before veering southeast towards the Persian Gulf, the Euphrates River in the first century effectively divided the western and eastern worlds. To the east lay the vast kingdoms of China and India. Notably, ancient history recounts how Cyrus of Persia's army conquered Babylon by diverting the Euphrates River, allowing them to infiltrate and seize the city. During the prophesied Great Tribulation, an adversary from the east will traverse the Euphrates, passing through Babylon and eventually reaching Palestine. This imagery evokes a sense of foreboding as it aligns with the eschatological narrative of Revelation, signaling a significant geopolitical upheaval and the imminent fulfillment of apocalyptic prophecy. Revelation 9.14 depicts God instructing the sixth angel with the trumpet to release the four angels bound at the great river Euphrates. This directive raises intriguing questions about its significance. Exodus 27. 2 reveals that John hears this command emanating from the four horns of the brass altar. 
Thus, the voice commands the sixth angel, bearing the bell, to unleash the four bound angels situated at the Euphrates, once the border between Israel and Assyria. In the narrative of Revelation, the overarching theme underscores God's sovereignty over all events, whether permitting or orchestrating them. Particularly in the context of the end times, evil will ultimately face divine justice without escape. The mention of these angels being bound indicates their demonic nature, fallen from heaven and often residing in realms of darkness. Sin's association with the Euphrates Valley, believed to be the location of the Garden of Eden and possibly the site of the first murder, deepens the symbolism of the angels' captivity. Recent reports of peculiar voices emerging from the drying riverbed may signify a symbolic unveiling of a pathway, potentially signaling the unfolding of prophetic events. These occurrences foster a belief among many that current events signify the imminent return of Christ to vanquish his adversaries and establish his heavenly kingdom. Notably, Pastor Joseph Kabuleta of Watchman Ministries recently convened a watchers meeting in Uma, Uganda, urging attendees to remain vigilant for signs of the end times. At the 2022 gathering on September 17th, Kabuleta delivered a message of startling revelations, elucidating intricate biblical prophecies and demonstrating how many have already come to pass. His efforts aim to provide clarity amid the complexity of biblical predictions, preparing believers to navigate the tumultuous times ahead with discernment and faith. One of the recent prophecies concerning the end of the world that has seemingly manifested is the rejuvenation of the Dead Sea. This body of water, devoid of sea life and vegetation, and renowned as the saltiest sea on earth, was foretold by God to the prophet Ezekiel in Ezekiel 47 to be revitalized, with clean water supporting living organisms. In 2016, the discovery of freshwater fish ponds along its banks provided tangible evidence of the fulfillment of this prophecy. Pastor Kabuleta further expounds on the ominous battle prophesied in Ezekiel 38 and Revelation 9, slated to unfold near the Euphrates River in the final days. Scriptures describe a coalition of nations, including Turkey, Syria, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Iran, and entities symbolized by Gog and Magog, converging to confront Israel. Kabilaita posits that should a 200 million person army besiege Israel, the nation would be compelled to resort to nuclear deterrence or face obliteration. Revelation 16.12 foretells the drying up of the Euphrates River, facilitating troop movements during this anticipated conflict. A prophecy seemingly actualized by the recent drying of the river, projected to become permanent by 2040 without intervention. As catastrophic warfare ravages unprecedented devastation, a global effort ensues to broker a temporary peace accord, in alignment with Daniel 9.27's prophecy of a seven-year peace treaty. Subsequently, the reins of power will purportedly transition from human hands to divine intervention upon the conclusion of this period, heralding the return of Jesus Christ. These developments have stirred widespread apprehension as individuals grapple with the realization of prophecies previously dismissed as implausible. While some attribute the drawing of the Euphrates to political machinations or climate change, others discern divine orchestration aligning with biblical narratives. Even amidst skepticism regarding divine involvement, Elon Musk's response to these phenomena remains grounded in scientific inquiry and empirical evidence. Despite his agnostic stance, Musk has refrained from dismissing these occurrences outright, instead corroborating his assertions with rigorous study and scientific analysis concerning the Euphrates River's dynamics. In essence, whether construed as fulfillment of ancient prophecies or ascribed to natural phenomena, the convergence of biblical narratives and contemporary events prompts profound contemplation on the trajectory of humanity and its ultimate destiny. Millions in Syria and Iraq are facing water shortages as the region's longest river, the Euphrates, dries up. As you can see, the Euphrates River is suddenly drying up. Surprisingly, a series of strange phenomena were recorded by people when approaching it. Sounds like angry screams were heard from inside. It really caused fear in everyone. Here is the video that captured that scary sound. Not stopping there, the water level lowered to reveal things below the bottom of the river that truly terrified everyone. Scientists and explorers also discovered a cave that had never been recorded in history. But what they found caused even more confusion. What they had done was leave behind something that was so stupendous. It was so strange and scary that they closed the river immediately. So what is hidden in that cave? 
Where did that scream come from? Watch till the end to find all the answer for these questions. If you like our video, don't forget to like and subscribe because it helps us a lot. Before answering the above question, remember that both appeared after the river suddenly disappeared. What does the drying up of the Euphrates River mean? As you know, this river is one of the longest and most historically influential rivers in Western Asia. This river is one of the longest and most historically influential rivers in Western Asia. But the real reason it is of so much interest today is that it is mentioned countless times in every book of the Bible. All consider this river as an extremely sacred and important place for all humans and the world. But people just consider it a legend and not true. Through recent events, those things are becoming more real than ever. Biblical scholars have presented various interpretations of passages in the Bible that mention the drying up of the Euphrates River. Some view it symbolically, suggesting it signifies the decline and fall of the once powerful Babylonian Empire, which eventually lost its dominance. Others interpret it as a harbinger of the end times, signaling Jesus' return to judge the world and separate the righteous from the wicked. In this latter interpretation, the drying up of the Euphrates is seen as a precursor to the unleashing of dark forces upon the world, possibly linked to the gathering of armies by the Antichrist to invade Israel. This scenario suggests that the dry riverbed of the Euphrates could facilitate the movement of armies across the river to attack Israel. The timing of these events remains uncertain, but contemplating the drying of the Euphrates during the end times serves as a solemn reminder of God's control over history. He will bring judgment upon the world for its sins, while also providing protection for His people. The interpretation and debate surrounding the biblical meaning of the Euphrates drying up is evident. However, what remains unequivocal is its symbolic representation of spiritual aridity, which can afflict those who distance themselves from God. The solution to this spiritual desolation lies in cultivating a relationship with God, who is referred to as living water in numerous scriptures. Scriptures such as John 4.14 and John 7.37, 38 underscore Jesus' invitation to quench spiritual thirst and receive eternal life through Him. In my book, Wake Up to Wonder, I delve into the symbolism of water, including the powerful imagery of the Euphrates, as emblematic of God's life-giving presence and renewal. Contemplating the drying of a river like the Euphrates serves as a poignant reminder of our need to remain connected to God's living water to avoid spiritual desiccation. The Origin of the Euphrates River When delving into the scriptures and their interconnections, a profound understanding of biblical narratives emerges leading us back to the genesis of our theological comprehension. In the tapestry of divine revelation, the Euphrates River assumes a pivotal role, its significance echoing from the dawn of creation to the annals of human history. The biblical chronicles unveil the Euphrates as one of the rivers cradling the Garden of Eden, the pristine abode fashioned by the hand of God for humanity's habitation. In the genesis of existence, the celestial oasis flourished, nourished by the life-giving waters coursing through its midst, eventually branching into the Pishon, Gihon, Tigris, and Euphrates. Speculations abound regarding the geographical location of Eden, with scholars positing regions spanning from Turkey and the Caucasus to the vicinity of the Persian Gulf, where these rivers find their confluence in modern times. Amidst the nebulous mists of antiquity, the Euphrates meanders, an enduring testament to the sacred geography of biblical lore. As the narrative unfolds, the divine spotlight shifts to Abraham, anointed as the progenitor of a chosen lineage. Residing in the ancient city of Ur, nestled along the shores of the Euphrates, Abraham's journey epitomizes divine providence amidst the ebb and flow of human history. While the modern landscape may obscure the once maritime splendor of Ur, archaeological vestiges stand testament to its illustrious past, now enshrined within the heartland of modern Iraq. Genesis chronicles Abraham's exodus from his ancestral homeland, guided by the divine promise of a land flowing with milk and honey, the verdant plains of Israel. This epical migration, fraught with trials and triumphs, heralded the dawn of a covenantal legacy, embraced by both Jewish and Arab descendants as the patrimony of their shared ancestry. There are any other reasons why the Euphrates River is drying up? There's been a lot of talk lately about the Euphrates River and how it's been slowly disappearing. There has been significant concern surrounding the gradual disappearance of the Euphrates River, prompting extensive investigation by scientists and experts into its causes. One proposed reason is the impact of climate change, which has resulted in decreased rainfall and increased evaporation in the region, 
thereby contributing to the river's diminishing water levels. Additionally, the construction of dams upstream has disrupted the natural flow of water, further exacerbating the river's depletion. Human activities such as excessive water usage for agriculture and industry have also played a role in reducing the river's water levels. The consequences of the Euphrates River's Vanishing Act are profound, affecting both the environment and local communities. The loss of this crucial water source has led to decreased agricultural productivity, impacting the livelihoods of farmers and communities reliant on the river for irrigation. Furthermore, the decline in water levels has disrupted the delicate ecosystem of the region, endangering plant and animal species that rely on the river for sustenance. Additionally, the disappearance of the Euphrates River has cultural and historical significance, severing the connection between present-day communities and their ancient roots. Despite ongoing efforts to understand the reasons behind the river's disappearance, including the exploration of mysterious caves in the area, the mystery remains unresolved. It is imperative that we prioritize the preservation and sustainable management of our natural resources to ensure their availability for future generations. What is hidden under Jordan River? The drying up of the Jordan River has unveiled a myriad of mysteries deeply intertwined with biblical narratives, serving as a compelling testament to divine will. Among the most renowned tales from the Bible is that of Moses and the Exodus of the Israelites, a narrative steeped in historical and theological significance. Exodus, the second book of the Bible, has long been a subject of scholarly scrutiny, with debates surrounding its historical accuracy and the veracity of claims regarding the migration of the ancient Israelites from Egypt. In a remarkable turn of events, a theologist has unearthed evidence that corroborates the biblical account of Moses, leading the Israelites out of Egyptian bondage and into the promised land of Canaan. Despite persistent skepticism regarding the historicity of Exodus, archaeologists Ralph K. Hawkins and David Ben Shlomo have identified ruins indicative of a nomadic settlement believed to align with the biblical narrative. These ruins, characterized by low stone walls resembling animal enclosures, offer tantalizing clues suggesting the presence of nomadic people traveling from Egypt. While definitive proof linking these settlements to the early Israelites remains elusive, the discovery fuels speculation that these sites may indeed correspond to the biblical narrative of Israelites traversing the Jordan River and settling in the hill country of Israel. The archaeological expedition extends beyond mere speculation, with plans underway to excavate nearby sites such as Uja al mukherka in pursuit of further evidence supporting the existence of Israelite settlements in the region. Such endeavors underscore the interdisciplinary nature of biblical scholarship, where historical research converges with archaeological inquiry to shed light on ancient narratives. This recent discovery is but one in a series of stunning revelations that have emerged from the region in recent years. In 2013, at Kirbet El Masari in the Jordan Valley, Hawkins and Ben Shlomo unearthed stone ruins and pottery fragments dating back to the Late Bronze Age, 1400 to 1200 BC or the Iron Age, 1200 to 1000 BC. These findings provide invaluable insights into the material culture of ancient civilizations, offering a tangible connection to the distant past. Yet perhaps the most groundbreaking discovery in the region came with the unearthing of the Dead Sea Scrolls at Qumran. Prior to this discovery, scholars grappled with the scarcity of Hebrew manuscripts predating the 10th century AD. However, the Dead Sea Scrolls, dating back to the 2nd century BC, revolutionized our understanding of the Hebrew Bible, bridging a millennium-long gap in textual transmission. These ancient manuscripts, found within 11 caves at Qumran, contain copies of every book of the Old Testament except Esther, affirming the accuracy and reliability of the biblical texts. The discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls not only provided unprecedented access to ancient Hebrew manuscripts, but also shed light on ancient Jewish customs, such as the practice of Ganza, a tradition wherein worn-out sacred manuscripts were stored in earthen vessel. Phil Estratos, in his account within The Life of Apollonia of Tiana, further embellishes the narrative, attributing the construction of this tunnel not to Queen Semiramis, but rather to Queen Media. Regardless of the attribution, the tunnel's existence transcends individual accolades, solidifying its status as a testament to ancient ingenuity. Yet amidst the echoes of history, whispers of a more ominous nature emerge. Tales abound of spine-chilling sounds resonating from the depths beneath Babylon's surface. Eerie manifestations believed by some to herald the unleashing of four fallen angels, 
portending cataclysmic events foretold in apocalyptic prophecies. The juxtaposition of ancient engineering prowess with eschatological forebodings prompts contemplation. Are these mere coincidences or do they signify a deeper cosmic significance? Such speculations evoke fear and trepidation, conjuring visions of impending doom. However, amidst the shadow of impending darkness, a beacon of hope emerges. The promise of redemption and deliverance. Christian doctrine espouses the triumph of good over evil, with Christ's sacrificial victory heralding an era of salvation. The scriptures affirm Christ's dominion over all principalities and powers, assuring believers of ultimate triumph over the forces of darkness. In the tapestry of eschatological narratives, the drawing of the Euphrates assumes symbolic significance, foretelling a climactic confrontation between divine and malevolent forces. As the river's waters recede, paving the way for apocalyptic armies to converge, the stage is set for a final reckoning. A cosmic battle between light and darkness, righteousness and wickedness. Amidst the chaos of impending tribulation, faith serves as an anchor, offering solace amidst the storm. The promise of Christ's imminent return instills hope, transcending mortal fears and uncertainties. In the face of impending judgment, believers find reassurance in the immutable promise of eternal life, secured through faith in the redemptive power of Christ. Thus, as the ancient waters of the Euphrates ebb, heralding the dawn of eschatological fulfillment, let faith illuminate the path forward, guiding believers through the tumultuous currents of history towards the promised shores of eternal salvation. Is there a surprising link between recent discoveries in the dried-up Euphrates River and the era of Donald Trump's presidency? Much like the river's historical and prophetic importance in Scripture, Trump's time in office was marked by controversy and significance. What if these newfound revelations from the Euphrates cave could offer a fresh perspective on Trump's role in shaping modern history? Join me as we explore whether there's more to this connection than meets the eye and how it might reshape our understanding of both biblical narratives and recent political events. Journeying further along the path of history, one encounters the mighty Euphrates River, which serves as the eastern border promised by God to Abram and his descendants. Revelations hint at profound end-time prophecies linked to this very waterway. Former U.S. President Donald Trump sparked controversy with his bold religious declarations and frequent biblical references in speeches, contributing to his successful election. Recently, anxieties have surfaced over the drying of the Euphrates River, with fears heightened by the prospect of unearthed discoveries within its depths, prompting questions about the fulfillment of prophecy. Is the former U.S. president trying to warn believers about the signs of the end times? Former U.S. President Donald Trump's attention to the significance of the Euphrates River might indeed suggest a warning to believers about potential signs of the end times. Flowing through Turkey, Syria, and Iraq, the Euphrates holds immense importance as a vital resource in the Middle East and a prominent fixture in Scripture, situated within the region known as the Fertile Crescent. Its diminishing water levels over recent years have unveiled significant historical remnants, including a cave and other ruins, prompting interpretations aligning with biblical prophecies. Two passages in the Bible specifically foretell the drying up of the Euphrates River. Jeremiah 50 38 portrays God's judgment upon Babylon, declaring a drought upon its waters, symbolizing divine punishment for idolatry. Notably, the Euphrates and Tigris rivers are referenced as the waters of Babylon, both experiencing diminishing flows in contemporary times, raising questions about the fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy. Revelation further amplifies the significance of the Euphrates, mentioning four angels bound at the river, poised to unleash havoc upon humanity. This portrayal sparks contemplation about the river's role in eschatological events. Revelation 16.12 introduces an intriguing prophecy regarding the river's drying, symbolically paving the way for kings from the east. The imagery evokes historical strategies employed by ancient armies, suggesting symbolic and possibly literal interpretations regarding future geopolitical shifts. The second prediction of the Euphrates River's drying is embedded within the seven bold judgments outlined in Revelation, marking a crucial element within the seven-year tribulation period. These judgments, encompassing seals, trumpets, and bowls, signify escalating divine interventions culminating in apocalyptic events. Trump's acknowledgement of these biblical motives may indeed underscore a broader awareness of potential prophetic fulfillments amid contemporary geopolitical realities. The Battle of Armageddon, according to premillennialists. 
Allow me to commence by outlining the sequence of events surrounding the Armageddon battle, as perceived through this particular lens. Presently, we find ourselves in what is referred to as the Church Age. According to premillennialism, Jesus initially came to establish his eternal kingdom on earth. However, due to the rejection and crucifixion, a secondary plan was set in motion, postponing the establishment of his kingdom. In the interim, the Church Age unfolds. At the culmination of this period, Jesus is anticipated to return and discreetly remove his followers from the earth in an event known as the Rapture. The saints are believed to vanish mysteriously, leaving the rest of humanity to continue life as usual. Following the rapture, a seven-year tribulation period ensues, designed to prepare Israel to receive its Messiah. A remnant of Jews is expected to embrace the gospel and serve as evangelists, while some Gentiles also turn to the Lord during this time. Amidst this period, a figure known as the Antichrist emerges, gaining popularity as a ruler over Europe and opposing the work of Jesus Christ. The ultimate clash between the forces of the Antichrist and Jesus Christ, termed the Battle of Armageddon, is prophesied to unfold. After Jesus emerges victorious over Satan, he is foreseen to establish his kingdom on earth and reign gloriously for 1,000 years. The conflict is envisioned to transpire as follows. Egypt initiates hostilities against Israel, potentially catalyzed by existing tensions in the Middle East. Simultaneously, Russia invades the Near East, extending its conquest to Egypt. Following this, Russia hears rumors from the East and returns to Israel to defend its newly acquired territory. A nuclear confrontation leads to Russia's defeat, creating a power vacuum in Israel promptly filled by the Antichrist. Europe, under the Antichrist's leadership, then engages in battle with the East and subsequently with the Jewish people. It is postulated that Christ's second coming occurs at this juncture, where he engages in a physical confrontation with the forces of Satan led by the Antichrist and emerges triumphant. With his enemies vanquished, Jesus establishes his kingdom, reigning from Jerusalem for 1,000 years. During this period, a temple is purportedly rebuilt and animal sacrifices reinstated, ushering in an era of Christ's glorious reign. The imminence of these events has been a recurring theme in premillennialist thought, often invoking a sense of urgency in evangelism. This theological framework, whether intentionally or unintentionally, serves to instill a sense of urgency in individuals to embrace the gospel, with the belief that the end times are swiftly approaching. However, an alternative interpretation suggests that the Battle of Armageddon symbolizes God's ultimate victory over Satan. Rather than a literal, physical conflict, it is viewed as a symbolic representation of divine triumph. In this understanding, despite appearances suggesting Satan's temporary dominion, the ultimate victory belongs to God. As such, Christians are encouraged to align themselves with the victorious Christ rather than siding with the defeated Satan. In conclusion, while premillennialism presents a specific interpretation of the Battle of Armageddon and the events surrounding it, alternative perspectives emphasize its symbolic significance in portraying God's ultimate triumph over evil. Thus, the interpretation of biblical prophecy, including the Battle of Armageddon, remains a subject of debate and interpretation among theologians and scholars. End Time Prophecy In Revelation 19.11.20, we witness the climactic showdown of Christ's second coming, where he triumphantly vanquishes the armies of the Antichrist. This momentous event, often referred to as the Battle of Armageddon in Revelation 16, symbolizes the ultimate victory of good over evil. The passage vividly describes Christ riding a white horse, known as Faithful and True, embodying justice and waging war with eyes ablaze like fire and wearing many crowns. His robe, stained with blood, bears the name Word of God. Accompanied by the heavenly hosts, symbolized by riders on white horses dressed in fine linen, he emerges with a sharp sword from his mouth, symbolizing divine judgment. An angel calls forth the birds to partake in the great supper of God, signifying the destruction of the wicked. The beast, representing the Antichrist, along with earthly rulers and their armies, futilely oppose Christ but are swiftly defeated. The false prophet and the beast are cast into the fiery lake, while the rest face the sword from Christ's mouth. The location of Armageddon, though uncertain, is commonly associated with the hill country near the plain of Megiddo, a site steeped in historical significance due to its numerous battles. According to the Futurist interpretation of Revelation, which aligns with our perspective, the Battle of Armageddon is yet to come, anticipated near the end of the Tribulation period. 
Influenced by demonic forces, earthly powers will rally for an assault on Jerusalem, led by the Antichrist. Christ's return with the heavenly armies will mark the decisive turning point. He will defeat evil, casting the Antichrist and the false prophet into damnation, binding Satan, and establishing his thousand-year reign on earth. At Armageddon, Christ will execute divine justice, symbolized by treading the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty, ushering in an era of ultimate restoration and righteousness. Have any aspects of the end times prophecy been fulfilled? In Revelation 4, 1, we encounter the anticipation of future events, particularly those concerning the end times. These prophetic passages depict a series of events yet to unfold, including the tribulation, the emergence of the Antichrist, and other significant occurrences. While these prophesied events have not manifested in their entirety, there are discernible signs of their imminent approach. Jesus forewarned of the last days, highlighting the proliferation of false messiahs, escalating conflicts, and a rise in natural disasters as precursors to the culmination of human history. These signs, often termed as the beginning of sorrows, echo throughout our contemporary world, where false doctrines, warfare, and environmental upheavals abound, signaling a preparation for the tribulation period. The Apostle Paul further emphasized the prevalence of false teachings and moral degradation in the end times, describing a society characterized by rampant selfishness, immorality, and a departure from spiritual truths. Indeed, our present age reflects a troubling conformity to such prophetic descriptions, with moral relativism permeating even religious institutions, leading to doctrinal compromises and ethical dilution. Moreover, geopolitical developments, such as the formation of the European Union and the re-establishment of Israel as a sovereign nation in 1948, hold significant implications in the context of biblical prophecy. These events align with scriptural references to a revived Roman Empire and the restoration of Israel, underscoring their relevance to end-time scenarios. The ongoing conflict between Israel and Hamas, while a source of sorrow and apprehension for many, is viewed by some evangelical Christians as a potential fulfillment of prophecy. This perspective, rooted in interpretations of biblical passages concerning the role of Israel in end-time events, underscores the divergent reactions to geopolitical crises within religious communities. The intertwining of religious beliefs with political agendas, particularly concerning the support for Israel, has historical precedents dating back to the interwar period and has persisted through subsequent decades. This alliance, driven by theological convictions and geopolitical considerations, underscores the complex interplay between faith and global affairs. Jesus' prophetic discourse, as recorded in the Synoptic Gospels, provides insights into the signs heralding His second coming. While interpretations of these signs have varied over the centuries, the convergence of certain geopolitical realities in the post, World War II era lends credence to the notion that ours may indeed be the generation witnessing the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. One such prophecy pertains to the existential threat posed by humanity's technological advancements, particularly in the realm of nuclear weaponry. The capability for mass destruction, a relatively recent development in human history, underscores the precariousness of our modern era and the potential for cataclysmic events to precipitate global upheaval. The proliferation of nuclear arsenals among various nations, coupled with the rise of radical ideologies and geopolitical tensions, accentuates the specter of nuclear terrorism and interstate conflicts. The destabilizing influence of extremist groups and the resurgence of geopolitical rivalries evoke echoes of past conflicts while posing new challenges to global security. Amidst these tumultuous developments, the promise of divine intervention offers hope amidst uncertainty. The assurance of Christ's eventual return, foretold amidst the chaos and tribulations of the end times, serves as a beacon of hope for believers amidst the gathering storm. In recognizing the gravity of contemporary challenges, we are reminded of the ultimate triumph of God's kingdom over the forces of darkness. The intersection of biblical prophecy with contemporary events invites reflection on the deeper significance of our times. While uncertainties abound and challenges loom large on the horizon, the steadfast hope in the fulfillment of God's promises sustains believers amidst the turbulence of the present age. As we navigate the complexities of geopolitics and societal upheavals, may we remain vigilant and faithful, ever mindful of the redemptive hope heralded by the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
Millions in Syria and Iraq are facing water shortages as the region's longest river, the Euphrates, dries up. Prepare to be astounded by the startling revelation that has shaken the world. The once sacred Jordan River, renowned for its religious and historical significance, has undergone a chilling transformation. Its waters, once revered for their symbolic importance across cultures, have turned a haunting shade of crimson, a dire omen of impending doom. But the mystery surrounding this sacred waterway only deepen as recent events unfold. Amidst the eerie crimson hue, a shocking truth emerges. The river, a lifeline for countless civilizations, now lies barren and desolate. What grim enigma lies concealed within its depths? What ancient secrets have been unearthed, laid bare for all to see? Could the river's desolation be a divine reckoning, a harbinger of divine wrath? Join us as we delve into the heart of this enigmatic saga, uncovering the hidden truths that defy explanation. Brace yourself for a journey into the unknown as we confront the looming specter of tribulation and seek solace in the power of prayer. Jordan River's dry up is happening? Now, if Jesus were to immerse himself in the Jordan River, he might find it impossible. This once mighty biblical waterway has been reduced to a mere trickle, resembling more a stagnant sludge than the revered lifeline it once was. Back in the early 1960s, the river flowed with vigor, transporting 1.3 billion cubic meters of fresh water annually from the Sea of Galilee to the Dead Sea. However, in recent years, this flow has dwindled dramatically, plummeting by over 90% to a mere 100 million cubic meters. This stark decline in Jordan's volume is not only a cause for concern in itself, but also holds dire implications for the Dead Sea. As the Jordan River shrinks, so too does the once mighty Dead Sea, its water level receding by a meter each year. At this alarming rate, the very existence of the world's saltiest large body of water hangs in the balance, teetering on the brink of oblivion. But the drying up of the Jordan River is not solely an environmental catastrophe. It carries profound historical and religious significance as well. Reflecting on biblical accounts, one is reminded of God's intervention parting the waters of the Jordan for the Israelites, much akin to the miraculous crossing of the Red Sea with Moses. This divine act held immense significance for the Israelites, symbolizing God's providence and protection. Yet the drying up of the Jordan River today raises unsettling questions. Is this another manifestation of divine will, a continuation of God's miraculous intervention to save His people? Or is it a warning sign, a call to action amidst the burgeoning environmental crisis plaguing the region? Indeed, the challenges facing the Jordan River and its surrounding region are manifold. The small Middle Eastern nation, already grappling with aridity, faces escalating temperatures and a burgeoning population, exacerbating an already precarious situation. As we confront this modern-day crisis, we are compelled to reflect on the sacred history intertwined with these waters. Just as God once dried up the Jordan to deliver His people, so too must we heed the call to safeguard this precious resource and protect the land entrusted to us. What is hidden under Jordan River? The drying up of the Jordan River has unveiled a myriad of mysteries deeply intertwined with biblical narratives, serving as a compelling testament to divine will. Among the most renowned tales from the Bible is that of Moses and the Exodus of the Israelites, a narrative steeped in historical and theological significance. Exodus, the second book of the Bible, has long been a subject of scholarly scrutiny, with debates surrounding its historical accuracy and the veracity of claims regarding the migration of the ancient Israelites from Egypt. In a remarkable turn of events, a team of archaeologists has unearthed evidence that corroborates the biblical account of Moses, leading the Israelites out of Egyptian bondage and into the promised land of Canaan. Despite persistent skepticism regarding the historicity of Exodus, Archaeologists Ralph K. Hawkins and David Ben Shlomo have identified ruins indicative of a nomadic settlement believed to align with the biblical narrative. These ruins, characterized by low stone walls resembling animal enclosures, offer tantalizing clues suggesting the presence of nomadic people traveling from Egypt. While definitive proof linking these settlements to the early Israelites remains elusive, the discovery fuels speculation that these sites may indeed correspond to the biblical narrative of Israelites traversing the Jordan River and settling in the hill country of Israel. The archaeological expedition extends beyond mere speculation, with plans underway to excavate nearby sites such as Uja al mukherka in pursuit of further evidence supporting the existence of Israelite settlements in the region. 
Such endeavors underscore the interdisciplinary nature of biblical scholarship, where historical research converges with archaeological inquiry to shed light on ancient narratives. This recent discovery is but one in a series of stunning revelations that have emerged from the region in recent years. In 2013, at Kirbet El Masari in the Jordan Valley, Hawkins and Ben Shlomo unearthed stone ruins and pottery fragments dating back to the Late Bronze Age, 1400 to 1200 BC, or the Iron Age, 1200 to 1000 BC. These findings provide invaluable insights into the material culture of ancient civilizations, offering a tangible connection to the distant past. Yet, perhaps the most groundbreaking discovery in the region came with the unearthing of the Dead Sea Scrolls at Qumran. Prior to this discovery, scholars grappled with the scarcity of Hebrew manuscripts predating the 10th century AD. However, the Dead Sea Scrolls, dating back to the 2nd century BC, revolutionized our understanding of the Hebrew Bible, bridging a millennium-long gap in textual transmission. These ancient manuscripts, found within 11 caves at Qumran, contain copies of every book of the Old Testament except Esther, affirming the accuracy and reliability of the biblical texts. The discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls not only provided unprecedented access to ancient Hebrew manuscripts, but also shed light on ancient Jewish customs, such as the practice of Ganza, a tradition wherein worn-out sacred manuscripts were stored in earthen vessels and buried within caves. This practice, spanning from 48 BCE to 318 CE, underscores the reverence accorded to sacred texts within ancient Jewish communities, illuminating the cultural and religious milieu of the time. In sum, the drying up of the Jordan River has not only unraveled archaeological mysteries, but also reaffirmed the enduring relevance of biblical narratives. Through interdisciplinary collaboration and meticulous excavation, scholars continue to unearth clues that deepen our understanding of ancient civilizations and their cultural heritage. As we delve further into the depths of history, each discovery serves as a testament to the enduring legacy of the biblical narrative and its profound impact on the human experience. What has happened since the Jordan River dried up? The ramifications of a dried up river reverberate across various sectors, particularly in the Middle East, where healthy waterways are vital for sustenance and economic activity. The Jordan River, in particular, plays a pivotal role in supporting crucial industries such as agriculture and tourism, and providing drinking water. In the agricultural sector, the Jordan River serves as a lifeline, facilitating irrigation for crops essential for local communities' survival. However, its diminishing flow poses a significant threat to crop growth and agricultural productivity. Moreover, the tourism industry, which thrives on religious sites along the river, faces a bleak future if Jordan's waters continue to dwindle. Pilgrims and visitors seeking to retrace Jesus' footsteps and partake in baptisms in the same river would find their experiences diminished, leading to a decline in tourism revenue. While Israeli residents have largely shifted to desalinated water from the Mediterranean Sea for drinking purposes, the loss of the Jordan River's flow would still have profound consequences. Despite technological advancements in water treatment, the river's ecological significance cannot be understated. It sustains a diverse array of life forms and ecosystems, playing an integral role in the region's environmental balance. In essence, the drying up of the Jordan River threatens not only economic stability, but also the very fabric of life in the region. Urgent measures are needed to address this crisis and ensure the preservation of this invaluable resource for generations to come.